We are now on the last of the digestive metabolism PowerPoints. Uh, as I mentioned before, the carb, protein, and lipid metabolism are the big topics that I want to make sure you know. These topics are still worth covering, but they're not quite at the same level. But we need to still talk about them. So the absorptive state, also called the fed state, we talk about two metabolic states, the absorptive and the post-absorptive, the fed state and the unfed state. The fed, not, not federal government. Fed means like having eaten. So this lasts about four hours during and after a meal. Time of nutrient absorption and use for energy needs. That's what you're doing during the absorptive or fed state. Carbs, blood glucose is available to all cells for ATP synthesis. So as you're eating, you're getting glucose into your blood and now all your cells are able to make their ATP and stay alive. Excess converted to, by the liver to glycogen or lipids. And do you know the words for those? You should right now. How, what's, what's the word for converting glucose to glycogen? That would be glycogenesis. What about converting carbs to lipids? That would be lipogenesis. That's what's happening during this time. Fats, taken up by fat cells from chylomicrons in the blood, remember, that were absorbed into the lacteals, dumped in the, through, the sub, through the right lymphatic duct and thoracic duct into the subclavian veins. Now they're available. Primary energy substrate for liver fat and muscle cells. So yeah, liver fat, skeletal muscle cells, they're all very happy to use fats for energy. Um, Whereas the brain wants glucose, that was glucose sparing, as we said. Amino acids, they pass through the liver before they go on to other cells. Remember, they're the building blocks of proteins. So the amino acids in the blood can be taken in by cells and used to make whatever proteins they need. Remember, cells are little protein factories. They're always making proteins. They need amino acids to do that. Used for protein synthesis, they can be used as for fuel for ATP synthesis or used for fatty acid synthesis. Again, your body is so versatile. If you don't have enough of any particular nutrient, your body can move them around, convert one to the other. So cute little puppy dog, that's what some of you look like. I've seen you picking out, crash, fall asleep. My son used to do that, my middle son especially, sit in the high chair, he'd be chewing, he'd fall asleep. He'd go, Nathan! He would wake up, keep chewing for a few moments till he fell asleep again. Upper right, that's an obese chipmunk. And that makes me so sad. I normally don't ever go to the south rim of the Grand Canyon, basically never. I go to the north rim of the Grand Canyon just to uh, get my backcountry permit there. And I see my buddy Steve, who runs the office. And uh, he and I have both seen parts of the Grand Canyon that most people never see. So it's fun to catch up every year and talk about new stuff we've seen and so on. But... At the North Rim, there are a cajillion people, and they're all eating food, and they see the cute little chipmunks, and they think, oh, it won't hurt to throw a little piece of French fry or whatever. You know, that's what the chipmunks end up looking like. It's very sad. So how do we regulate the absorptive state? Well, insulin, all right? Secreted in response to elevated blood glucose and amino acid levels and by incretin, secretin, and cholecystokinin, those hormones we talked about a while back when we looked at the... Uh, liver and the small intestine, the pancreas, and so on. So insulin increases cellular uptake of glucose by 20-fold. So cells can get glucose in under normal situations, but in, insulin makes it much easier. They can get in 20 times as much. Stimulates glucose oxidation, so the burning of glucose for fuel. Also glycogenesis and lipogenesis. In other words, if we're pulling sugar out of the blood, we've got to put it someplace. Where do we put it? Well, we turn it into glycogen or we turn it into fat. It makes sense. See, you don't have to memorize these things. They make, they make logical sense. But it's going to inhibit gluconeogenesis. Can you see why? If you've already got a bunch of glucose in the blood and you're trying to pull it out, why would you make more glucose? You've already got tons of glucose. Insulin also stimulates active transport of amino acids into cells and promotes protein synthesis. A lot of people seem to know that insulin gets glucose in, but it's amino acids as well. So remember, those are the two that were absorbed directly into your blood and the small intestine. Those are the ones that you need for energy and for making proteins. So by golly, your cells need those, and insulin helps your cells get both of those in, glucose and amino acids. High protein, low carb meals stimulate release of both insulin and glucagon to prevent hypoglycemia. Yeah, and that's not a big deal, but you, you can see that you might have to have both hormones to maintain blood sugar homeostasis. 
That diagram on the bottom right is outstanding. I love the little green lights for go and the little stop signs. You should be able to look through that and figure out and see why insulin is doing all of those things. In other words, why is insulin preventing gluconeogenesis? Why is it preventing, that should be glycogenolysis. Why is it stimulating glycolysis? Why is it stimulating glycogen synthesis, which would be glycogenesis? You should be able to follow that diagram through and see how it makes sense. The post-absorptive state, or the unfed state, this is where homeostasis of blood glucose is critical to the brain. So since you're not eating, um, you've got to then make glucose available in your blood for your brain to use, okay? So we have to, if we're not eating, we have to use our stored fuels. So carbs, um, glucose drawn from glycogen reserves for up to four hours and then synthesized from other compounds, that again would be gluconeogenesis. That word makes sense. Sorry, my music stopped. What the hell is going on? Um, fat. Adipocytes and liver cells um, convert glycerol to glucose. Remember glycerol from the triglycerides. Um, glycerol easily converted to glucose. And then the fatty acids oxidized by the liver to ketone bodies. We saw that already, so we already know about that. Other cells use free fatty acids for energy, leaving glucose for the brain. Glucose sparing. The brain only wants glucose. Let other cells use free fatty acids for energy. Protein metabolism. So use as fuel when glycogen and fat reserves are depleted. When basically is the only time. This is, a, this is not a happy state of affairs. This is, uh, you're only going to use proteins for energy if you're literally dying or starving to death or both, whatever. So... Wasting away occurs with cancer and other diseases, um, loss of appetite, altered metabolism. There are a variety of causes, but oops, I talked over the transition. Not supposed to do that. Um, yeah, that's not a happy state. Who regulates the post-absorptive state? Well, glucagon, of course, and the sympathetic nervous system. In other words, what we're going to have to happen here, usually, by the way, I ask my students when we start talking about the post-absorptive state, I say, how many of you have ever fasted? And like two or three hands go up. And I say every hand should have gone up. When you sleep at night, you're fasting. You're not eating. This is what has to happen. So glucagon is being secreted by your pancreas in order to raise blood glucose levels. Your sympathetic nervous system also does that, of course, because when you are fighting the chupacabra, you need lots of blood glucose to make that ATP so you don't die. Blood glucose drops. Glucagon is secreted. That's the stimulus and uh, stimulates glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis to raise glucose levels. You should be able to see that that makes sense and figure that out. Glycogenolysis, breaking down glycogen, turning it back into glucose. Gluconeogenesis, taking fats and amino acids and converting those to glucose. Stimulates lipolysis, breaking down the fat in order to raise free fatty acid levels as well. So you've got those free fatty acids that can be used by adipocytes, liver sites, liver cells, hepatocytes, by skeletal muscles. So there you can see the daily metabolic conditions there. So yeah, look it over for yourself. We use slightly different words, but it all makes sense. So regulating the post-absorptive state, um, sympathoadrenal effects. Like I said before, they will promote glyco the sympathetic nervous system is going to promote glycogenolysis, lipolysis, under conditions of injury, fear, anger, stress. When you're fighting the chupacabra, you need lots of blood glucose to make ATP so that you can kill it and not die. Adipose liver cells, muscle cells richly innervated also respond to epinephrine from the adrenal medulla. Again, sympathetic nervous system is trying to keep you alive. You need energy. Cortisol from the adrenal cortex promotes blood, blood glucose. We're going to talk a lot more about cortisol later when we do the endocrine system. Cortisol is an anti-inflammatory. It also increases blood glucose. That's actually one of the unfortunate side effects of people who have to take cortisol long term. Fat and protein catabolism and gluconeogenesis. So in other words, it's raising blood glucose by breaking down fats and proteins and then converting the components into glucose. Growth hormone also will keep blood sugars high because if you're growing, you need energy. So it makes sense. See? This all fits together. You don't have to memorize it. It makes sense. Which of the following will be stored as fat if you eat more than your body can use? Protein, sugar, starch, fat, or complex carbs? Pause the video. 
figure out your answer, and then continue. Oh, I hope you all saw that one coming. Yes, that's how efficient your body is. Paleolithic metabolism. No matter what you eat, store it for later if you don't need it right now. Anything you eat can be put away as fat reserves. Okay, metabolic rate. Energy expenditure per unit of time. Usually you can't actually measure ATPs and stuff, so you just measure how much oxygen people are using, since you need oxygen to make those ATPs. Your basal metabolic rate, your BMR, this is when you're relaxed, awake, fasting, at a comfortable temperature. In other words, how much energy does your body need just to maintain itself? You're not running or fighting or anything like that. You're just how much for basic maintenance. So they say adult male, you need about 18 kilocalories per day. You need about 2,500 to maintain weight. There are several things that energy is used for extraneously. So females, 1,400 kcals for your BMR, 2,000 to maintain weight. I'm, you don't have to memorize those numbers. I'm very happy. If, you'll, you'll see kind of the standard number that's used is 2,000. If you remember 2,000, I'm very happy. A typical person needs about 2,000 calories a day to maintain their weight. Now, obviously, it's going to be different for somebody who's like Kevin Durant, you know, seven feet tall, weighs 280 pounds. He might burn a little more energy, but overall, typical person, 2,000 calories a day. If you put in less than 2,000 calories a day, about, you're going to lose weight. Put in more, you'll probably gain weight. What affects BMR? Well, lots of things. Pregnancy, anxiety, fever, eating, thyroid hormones, depression. All those things can raise or lower your need for energy, all right? So that's why BMR, you only really talk about it at a resting state. Figure that, I mean, look, BMR, pregnancy, you got that little parasite. Holy smoke, you're going to need some more energy for that thing to, to grow so it later can borrow money from you. Um, if you ingest more calories than your caloric need, don't work them off with exercise, you're likely to gain weight. Jelly donut, 300 calories. Caramel sundae with whipped cream, 500. Single slice of cheesecake can be as much as 750. Oh yeah. So take a look at these pictures and see if you can figure out what they have in common. So here a typical meal from McDonald's. There's from, I don't know, whatever that place is. Ooh. Nantucket Nectar? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's Chipotle, yeah. Whatever that place is. Ooh, Denny's, Flapjacks, mmm. Ride that, um, ride that gold wing in there. Um, ooh, a latte, and a slice of chocolate cake. Ooh, pasta with deep fried chicky. Burger King, them onion rings. Mm. Okay, Wendy's. Little smiling redhead. Sparrow in the mall. Ooh, T-bone and a martini. Mmm, Italian food. Pasta, salad, wine. Looks so healthy. Ooh, more Italian healthy food. Subway, eat fresh. Ooh, look how much. And there's a Sonic shake. So what did all of those slides have in common, all those pictures? Those were all 2,000 calories. So for every one of those slides, if you eat everything in that picture, you're good for the day. You don't need any more food. You've got everything you need. Just think about that. That's why we have so much food around us, we're likely to overeat. The Sonic Shake there, I, that's, I think that's the caramel peanut butter. And actually the large size, I think it's, I, I haven't looked this up in a while. I think it was like 2,600 calories or something. Single sh Sonic Shake more than you need and for an entire day. Okay, body heat and thermal regulation. So homeostasis, your heat loss has to match your heat gain. You've got to maintain constant body temperature. Remember, we talked about that before. Hypothermia, hyperthermia, potentially life-threatening. So hypothermia, body temperature goes too low. That can low, slow metabolic activity, cause death because you won't be doing metabolism. You're not keeping yourself alive. Hyperthermia, excessively high body temperature, this is also quite dangerous. You can denature proteins, including enzymes, and then you're not going to be able to do anything. Both of those are potentially life-threatening. Thermoregulation, that's where you balance them. 
So look, lower left there you can see uh, strategies when you're shipwrecked to stay warm. Um, bottom right you see somebody overheating, some of the things you can do to try to keep them from dying. Body temperature, okay, normal, 37 Celsius, 98.6 Fahrenheit, very nice for sissies. Um, lower in the morning, higher in the afternoon. Our body temperature changes throughout the day, and it's different from one person to another. Just get to know your own body temperature. Values, depending on the method, so rectal and ear are usually going to be slightly higher. Axillary forehead, usually lower. Fever officially starts at 100.4 or 38. They didn't, 100.4 is not... The value they chose. They chose 38 and that converts to 100.4. So bottom right, you still have my rectal thermometer? Oh yeah. Heat production so comes from energy releasing chemical reactions such as nutrient oxidation and ATP use. We know about this. Brain, heart, liver, endocrine, muscles, yeah. Exercise greatly increases heat production in muscles. So the more you exercise, the more heat you build up. That's why you have to sweat. Okay? How do you lose heat? Lots of ways, and I'm really not going to stress these, all right? I'm, I'm telling you right now. I want you to look at them, just kind of basically get them, but I'm not going to hit you over the head with this. Radiation loss of body heat in the form of infrared waves, conduction, that's where you're in direct contact with something. Convection is through the air. So, evaporation, heat loss of sweat evaporates. This is the danger. Notice I've got the Grand Canyon picture in the bottom right. I know, I know you don't ever hear enough about the Grand Canyon from me, but um, as you um, uh, hike in hot weather, you know, the, you start sweating profusely, and that's in order to keep your body from overheating. Under extreme conditions, you can sweat as much as two liters per hour in order to keep your body cool. Now think about that. Two liters, that's roughly half a gallon. Two quarts of Gatorade. It's actually a little more than that. You can lose that much per hour. So you think about hikers out there and they've got a little pint bottle of water in hot weather. Uh, no, you're not going to make it. Thermoregulation. So hypothalamic thermostat monitors temperature of blood and skin and signals the heat losing center to stimulate sweating. Okay. Cutaneous vasodilation. Bring blood up to the surface. Let the air cool it down. Heat promoting center, so cutaneous vasoconstriction, clamp those blood vessels down so you don't over, uh, so that you can warm yourself up so you don't cool your blood down. And then erector pili muscle contraction, remember that raises the hairs, doesn't really work very well for humans, does for like dogs. And shivering, that's where, because you make um, ATP in your muscles, when you start doing shivering, you're making lots of ATP. And remember, one of the byproducts of ATP is heat. Uh, Non-shivering thermogenesis, so thyroid hormone and increase of BMR. We'll talk a lot more about thyroid hormone later on, but it also raises body temperature. And behavioral thermoregulation, if you're hot, get out of the damn sun, will you? For God's sakes, take off the extra clothing, all right? So, disturbances of thermoregulation, we're almost done here. I know this has been a long PowerPoint. Fever, yeah, normal protective mechanism elevates BMR. Um, so remember when you're sick, fever is up to about 102 or actually good, let them run. Hyperthermia, way too much. Heat cramps, muscle spasms, electrolyte imbalance. Heat exhaustion is actually the, uh, a bad term for what is more properly called hyponatremia. That's a lack of sodium. Fainting, dizziness, confusion, hypotension, cerebral edema, death. Hyponatremia, serious, they say hyponatremia kills more people than dehydration does. Heat stroke, that's where your body temperature goes over 104. You're in serious trouble now. You're on death's door. Delirium, convulsions, coma, death. Hypothermia, excess cold. So if your body temperature drops to 75, you die. Um, so a little more leeway there for hypothermia than for hyper. And there you go, breaking news. Shark saves swimmer from hypothermia. Film at 11. Oh, that lucky woman. Okay, so it took Tom six hours to ascend the Lava Falls route at the Grand Canyon under extreme conditions. This was over 100 degrees in direct sun. It's actually nearly 120 at the bottom. About how many gallons of water did he need to consume to replace the water lost through sweat? 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, 2, or 3? So, are you good at your metric and 
English system conversions here. So remember, you can lose two liters per hour. That's roughly half a gallon. Took me six hours to hike up Lava Falls. How much water did I need to drink? That's right, three gallons. Water is eight pounds a gallon. It's not fun to carry three gallons of water. That's 25 gallons right there, along with all the other stuff in your pack. Um, and the Lava Falls route is actually very dangerous. Um, a lot of people fall to their deaths on that route. It's happened many times, so there's precarious footing. Carrying all that weight is not a good idea. What I actually did is when I hiked down, I had three two-liter hydration packs hanging off the back of my backpack. When I got a fourth of the way down, I left one of them there and marked it. Got halfway down, left another one. Three-fourths of the way down, left another one. When I got to the bottom, I had drunk all the water I brought with me in my backpack around a gallon. As I started back up, I refilled my water pack in my backpack in the Colorado River. So I got up, I carry about a gallon and a half in my pack. And then as I hiked up, when I got to the one fourth of the way up, there was half a gallon waiting for me. When I got halfway up, another half gallon, three quarters up, another half gallon. Even then, I, and I drank all that water. I drank, you know, all that water on the way back up, around five gallons or so. And no, that's three gallon and a half, three gallons. I drank about three gallons on the way up. And even then I was so dehydrated that I literally sprinted to my truck when I got to the top and chugged two liters, two uh, quarts of Gatorade. Sun going down, it had been rainy that day. Those are called Mamatus clouds. I love the way the sun lit them up. That patch on the right was like so bright, it was almost like a second sun. It was hard to look at it, it was so bright. Grand Canyon is just one of the most beautiful places on the planet. Okay, kids, we're done. All we have left uh, for next week is the urinary physiology.